Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me onto the podcast, firstly. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm currently in London, uh, specifically in Wembley. So not too far from, from Wembley Stadium, which is where dreams are made of. Um, <laughs> and yeah, a little bit about me. So I'm currently working at University of East London as a coach. So I'm part of their coaching staff there with the first and second team. I'm also head of foundation at SH Football Academy. So that's a junior Premier League club. And then obviously working at Pro Football Academy, which is one of the largest, if not the biggest, um, private coaching companies in the whole of the UK as well. Nice. So the uh, reason why I wanted to get Phil on the uh, podcast today, because he's got a lot of experience in different coaching roles. And I know for any coach that has a training business that watches our channel on a regular basis, you're going to get a lot of value from uh, what Phil is going to share with you today. So, Phil, tell us a little bit about your coaching journey and, you know, what 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 your aspirations in coaching? Yeah, so it all started off five years ago. Ish, I had just finished my GCSEs and I was sort of thinking, what's next for me in life? You know, about to turn 16, it's kind of thinking about what's next. So my passion for football has always been there. I played football for, you know, over 12 years of my life, ever since I was a little kid. Never made it to any sort of high level of football. Um, so being a footballer was never never going to be a career. So the closest to that and something I always enjoyed was learning from my coaches and I had some really good ones. Um, so I remember I went on social media and I just posted a message saying, I'm interested in coaching. Is there any clubs that would hire someone who has no experience but is willing to learn? And I remember there were probably hundreds of clubs who are looking for volunteers, for coaches who can help them because finding a coach sometimes can be difficult. Um, so I started off at a very local club to me, Sholing Football Club, um, who their men's team is actually a non-league club. Um, so I started off coaching their very youngest age group, so their under sevens. Um, and that's how that's how the journey began. And then from there, I went on to obviously complete my college programme for two years. From there, I went on to university, moving here to London, um, and yeah, and through that time, I've had, like you say, loads of different coaching coaching opportunities. So I worked in the women's game for 18 months at university level. So that was London School of Economics first team and King's College London second team. I've had experience at, you know, different youth age groups. So all the way from under sevens through to sort of under 14s and then some little mini roles with under 16s and under 18s as well. So yeah, it's just it's just been a long journey from from five years. Um, obviously, going through my coaching badges as well, which has led to which has led to where I am now. Nice, like it. So one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on today because we're gonna we well you're gonna share with with our audience how to effectively uh, plan uh, a coaching curriculum. Uh, I know that's something that you're very uh, good at. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us a little bit. What makes an effective coaching a syllabus, whether you're working mm -hmm. with one on one clients, whether you're working with yeah. group? Yes, I think uh, two things come into that instantly that are the most important. It's the, the first thing is it has to be relevant and adaptable to the players, to the clients that you're working with. Um, because you can go on the FA website, you can go on Google, you can go on YouTube and you can find hundreds of coaching syllabuses and, and session plans. And that's great. And they're probably really good, but they might not be what your players need. So the, the, the first and really important thing is if you're thinking of setting up a business or you already have a coaching business and you want to build a session plan for that and a coaching syllabus for that, you need to know your clients and it needs to be what is needed for them. And the second thing is you want to try and make it, especially if you're working group sessions, you want to try and make it as game related as possible. Um, because ultimately when the players go into match day, that's what they're faced with. The coaches are stuck behind the white line. They can help a little bit, but the decision making and all the processes are the players on the pitch. So it's really important that the coaching syllabus you have is very, very game realistic. And we can talk about that later on about the sort of examples and stuff that you want. But yeah, those were probably the two main things. Make sure it's related to your players and it has a game related model to it. Nice, like that. So where does your your coaching uh, philosophy come from? It's, that is a, is a good question. And I think I think it's important to have a constantly changing coaching philosophy. And I'll give an example. So I went into a club um, a women's team when I was coaching at university and I joined halfway through the season. So I went in with my philosophy and the way that I want to play and I quickly realised 
these players need something different. So instantly we had to change the system and the style of play. And that led us to to winning three trophies at the club. So I think it's it's really important to be adaptable because every club you will face different players. Every business you will have different clients. And you're always having to change the way you coach. But mine came from probably my, my coaches. So the coaches I had growing up and the way that I played as a player through them. I think after that, a lot of it just comes down from coach education. So, you know, the things you learn and all your coaching qualifications and, and the degree that I'm currently doing in football coaching and management. And you learn a lot. And um, I think it's really important from my coaching philosophy, it kind of outlines three main things. And the first one is um, the coach athlete relationship. Mm -hmm. So how you are with your athletes and the relationship that you build up. The second thing would be your coach behaviors. So how you behave on a match day, how you behave in a training session in the sense of the way that you coach. Um, and then obviously the third one that I would say is being adaptable, which I've already spoken about. And those kind of three underpin my sort of values and, and the coaching philosophy that I have. That's amazing. So talk to us a little bit about, because you mentioned uh, the importance of game related uh, yeah. training for uh, working with clients and players. So talk to us mm -hmm. a bit about how do you structure your sessions? Yeah. So I think, Again, when we link back coaching syllabus and game-related models, it's important. What a lot of academies do um, is there's a heavy emphasis, especially in England, on ball mastery sessions. Um, pro, pro academies work probably 90 minutes a week minimum on unopposed ball mastery. And a part of that is great because the players get a lot of technical repetition and they learn skills and they become more confident in them. Um, however, a big downside to that is you can be fantastic at unopposed technical skills. But when it comes to a match day, you have to be able to implement that within an opposed setting, not just 1v1, but it might be 2v1. It might be getting pressed from in front, from behind to the side. And you have to make sure that the sessions that you plan, it cannot just be endless technical unopposed practices. So, for example, something how I would structure my sessions is loads of small-sided games. And the reason I say loads of small-sided games is um, you can do some research into the FA studies into this as well for any of your uh, viewers who want to. But a lot of small-sided games give you a lot of similar outcomes to what ball mastery sessions do, but they give you that within an opposed environment. So let's say you're doing a three against three or a four against four. The players have opportunities to dribble, opportunities to pass, opportunities to shoot, opportunities to make decisions because they have to make decisions when they're pressed. What do they do? When they're in a goal-scoring situation, what do they do? When they're in a crossing situation, what do they do? So by playing loads of small-sided games, they get a lot of technical outcomes. So mm -hmm. if we're linking the FA four-corner model, the technical side is now covered. They get tactical outcomes as well, because it might be a situation where we go to press. Or we're not going to go to press because only our striker is there. So now we're delaying and we're holding. So again, now we're looking at the principles of play. So technical and tactical corners are done. Mm -hmm. Then you've got your social corner. And by, by playing together in a team, they're obviously learning from each other. There's communication. So you're covering that social corner as well. Yeah. And then we mentioned decision making in a game related model. So you're covering that psychological corner as well, because it's mentally they are thinking, what do I do? Instead of us just telling them as coaches, you have to do this, you have to do this. Let them have an element of their own decision making. Mm -hmm. And that's why game related models are really important. So small sided games is a huge part of that. That's, that's amazing. So any any coach watching that does group training, you know, you can yeah. learn from what what Phil has just just talked about there. So, Phil, where, where do you see the industry going in terms of like uh, football training, uh, private mm -hmm. training? Where do you see it going? I think I mean, I started off so near 2019. So this is going back to when I first started coaching. I actually opened up my own coaching business with my dad. We worked it together and we were just doing one-to-one -one training. Um, in the summer months, we had probably five to eight players who were regularly training with us. Um, and it, was, it w wasn't any sort of large-scale business. It was just a small thing that we did on the side to help some players. Um, and I think since then, it's, it's grown a lot, especially in London. And I get a lot of parents who always ask, oh, I'm looking for a private trainer um, for my child. So I think it's something that's constantly evolving mm -hmm. in the industry is this kind of specialised one-to-one -one training and one-to-one -one coaching. But again, it has to be good and it has to be relevant to the players you're working with. But it's definitely, for the audience that's watching this, it's definitely something they're looking to get into 
either creating their business or they know players who want to go into um, one-to-one training. It's definitely something that's growing and something worth investing your time in because it, it can be time-consuming. Um, but it's something that's worth it because you get a lot of outcomes out of it in terms of helping the player in a more one-to-one setting. And it's definitely something that's growing. I mean, even even academies at the highest level, they have one-to-one trainers now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's if, if you've got an academy that also has works in the gym you've got personal trainers in there so a lot of this sort of one-to-one stuff is becoming more and more prevalent across across the game love that so when you bring on a player onto your your team or your program what's a bit some a bit of advice you can give to coaches to what what should coaches look for when they bring on clients into into their business yeah, well, the, the the first thing you do is obviously you look at, I think, the player's attitude and behaviour because you always want someone who's going to be good with the rest of the players you have if you're running group sessions. And if you're running just strictly one-to-one sessions, then you want someone who's willing to learn and has an attitude to learn because hmm. if they're not, then I'd question if one-to-one coaching is for that player because it's very specialised, it's very individual and you need someone who's ready to put in the work to see that individual development. So you want to look at sort of attitude and behaviour as the first two things. Mm-hmm. Then as a coach, you want to look at where can I improve this player? So what are they already good at? That's great. Forget that. Let's keep that. Let, let them be good at that. But where can I improve them? So my job as a coach now, what can I do to help that player be better? And it might be their decision making. It might be um, their defending. It might be the stuff they do with the ball. So in possession. And it might be a, a, there's so many things that a player can get help in. And a really good um, initiative or something you could do if you're running a coaching business is to keep, for example, Excel spreadsheets on your players. And you can make many graphs and different options for what you want to do. And you have the player's name, you have their age, you know, a club that they play for maybe. And you have strengths and weaknesses and areas to improve, etc. And you can week by week slowly build in a one-to-one training program that focuses on the weaknesses of that individual. And by doing that, you get the best out of them because the strengths that they have, they're already strengths. You don't need to work too much on them apart from re-emphasizing them and maybe doing some repetition on them so that they don't forget it. But the main aspect is that area for improvement. Where can we improve our player? And by giving them that sort of one-to-one individual size training, you can really, really help them improve. I love that. I love that. So at the beginning, you talked about the uh, athlete-coach relationship. So when you yeah. work with with either clients or, or players, what what are a few things you do to, to help mm-hmm. them succeed on and off the pitch? It's huge. It's huge. And I think it's something that we can all always learn. And I think the coach athlete relationship is is, is massive. And there's loads of research that, that goes into it as well from a, an academic perspective. But yeah, so I can give some examples. Um, working at different clubs, you obviously work with different players and your approach to those players has to be different. Um, for example, we've got one player um, currently in the team who possibly have some attitude problems but it's more a case of how you deal with him as a coach so if you if you're constantly shouting at him if you start him from the bench if you're not really having a positive relationship with him when he goes onto the pitch he will not perform and that's just his mentality his attitude he will not perform um but if you're very positive with him if you put an arm around him if you're there to support that player in turn, he will learn to trust you and like you, and he can be one of the best players on the pitch. Mm-hmm. So that coach-athlete relationship is really, really important because every athlete, first of all, forget that they're an athlete. They're a person before that. Mm-hmm. So they're just a human being, just as you're a human being. So that social interaction between person and person is really, really important because every person is different. Every person has a different personality, different things they're struggling with in life or in football. And you have to really make sure you know the person. If you know the person, you can then get to know the athlete. That's what I always say. Get to know the person, get to know the player. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really important to have an adaptable approach because, like I say, everyone is different. To, to one player, you might have to be a bit more, bit more shouty and a bit more disciplined and a bit more on him for him to work harder. But with other players, you just need to put an arm around them and say, it's OK, keep doing this, blah, blah, blah. And it's just really important to have that adaptable approach to to all your players. Fantastic. Love that. Great information. Uh, so another thing I wanted to touch on here and something that I really, well, I follow you on all your socials. And something you do a lot of is you you basically use your socials as kind of like a diary of your coaching mm-hmm. journey. 
Now, a yeah. problem a lot of coaches have that we work with is they don't know how to market and promote their business. Mm -hmm. so what, what's a couple of pieces of, of advice you can share to coaches uh, to how they can improve their marketing and, and promoting? That's a good question. I think the first one is if you're not already using social media for your business, um, get social media apps. So download the likes of Instagram, LinkedIn. TikTok is huge now um, in terms of posting little 60 second clips of possibly a one to one session onto TikTok. And you can honestly get thousands of views in the space of an hour or two. Um, it's, 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 it's a big platform now. Um, the other thing I'd say is use a lot of hashtags. So hashtag the kind of areas that you're working in, the the stuff that you'll train in. So, you know, just hashtag football coaching, hashtag London, hashtag Wembley, whatever it is. And you'll get a lot of people who either live in those areas or are interested in those topics. They will use that hashtag on Instagram or on LinkedIn and they will just scroll through the post that are hashtag using that specific hashtag. And you'll get a lot of views and, and, and traction through that. Um, and the, the next thing and the last thing is I remember when I first started both Instagram and LinkedIn and I didn't have many followers and I wasn't getting many, you know, so, sort of social media attention. Um, but I just pursued it, pursued posting, pursued making the content that I wanted to make, talking, like you say, a bit of an online diary of my coaching life. And eventually, you know, talking now, I've got around four and a half thousand followers on LinkedIn and over a thousand followers on Instagram in the space of five years. And that, that, that was never really a goal for me. It just kind of naturally happened. So the two things I'd say is definitely get social media, start using hashtags and make posts. And the second thing is be consistent. So constantly make posts, even if you're not getting the likes or the views or the followers that you want to be getting right now in six months time in a year's time you will be because people will see you're an active account you're constantly posting content that's related to what they're interested in and it will help you market your business out there because you'll get you know a lot of connections you'll meet people um and so those probably those two things yeah great stuff all right well phil uh, final question for you so yeah. where, where do you see yourself in five years time it's a good one. So I'm finishing my degree in May. So I'm going to graduate in August. So another two years, I want to do two master's qualifications or two postgraduate qualifications after this. So that's two years. I want to do my B license. So that's a year. So that's three years. Um, yeah, so probably have all of my education qualifications. So my, my master's, my PGC, obviously my degree and complete my UA for B license hopefully be working either at a semi-pro or professional club level um, and be in preparation to do my A license. So that's probably the sort of five-year plan for me in terms of coaching. Nice. Love that. Love that. Perfect. And how can any coach that wants to connect with you, how, what's the best way to do so? Um, so you can just search me on LinkedIn. So just type in Philip Nemeth or on Instagram. I think it's Phil underscore Nemeth underscore coach. So just type same, just my name and surname and you, you'll be able to find me. LinkedIn and Instagram are the main ones I use. If anyone wants to get in touch, ask any questions um, and stuff. So those, those two probably the main ones. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, Phil, thanks for uh, jumping on here, sharing with us your thanks journey. Thanks for having me. Uh, and also some tips on how to become a better coach, how to build a better business. Um, and what we'll do is we'll add all your socials below this video in the description so coaches can connect with you. Uh, and follow you because I, I know they'll definitely learn a lot from you. Fantastic, Leo. Thank you very much for having me on. See you soon.